You know, some time ago, I started compiling a list of all of the Flat Earth arguments that I came across, and today we're just going to pick one, and we're going to see what Flat Earthers have said about it. And of course, we're going to argue with them. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be my channel if we weren't arguing with people. So here's a good one. The atmosphere on a ball Earth would be sucked into the vacuum of space. So this one has a pretty easy explanation. It is not the nature of a vacuum to suck particles into it. Instead, it is the nature of gas to spread out from high pressure to low pressure. Okay, but that still begs the question, why is Earth's atmosphere sticking to the Earth and not spreading out into the abyss of space? And the answer is gravity. It's gravity is holding air on the planet. I'm not sure how much explanation you need, but gravity affects the molecules of a gas just as much as everything else. Of course, flat earthers aren't happy with this explanation. Now, globe proponents have only one answer, and that answer is almost always the same, gravity. Yes, good old magic sauce. So gravity holds the gas to earth. Well, let's see if we can show how this too is tragically flawed with some little diagrams I'll walk you through now. So we are on Earth and gravity is pulling down. In the left side of the chamber, we have gas pressure or air. On the right side, we create a vacuum. Okay, now here's the problem for globe defenders and space religious zealots. If I lower the divider just a tiny bit, just bring it down a hair, what do you think will happen to the gas on the left? Is this what Globers believe? That only the gas at the top would fill the vacuum? or would the gas fill the entire available space? Well, if you believe gravity holds the air pressure down to Earth, even though there is an adjacent vacuum, then you have an untested and an unproven claim because the gas will dissipate and fill the entire void. Okay, first off, this untested, unproven claim is yours entirely. Um, but if, if you want a, a genuine answer, it really depends on where this little gap at the top is, because it's if it's in an area where there's high enough pressure, then it may very well fill the entire thing if the gravity is not enough to fight that. But if this box is huge and this gap is at the top of the atmosphere, it may very well be the case that only a small amount of gas, or perhaps only a small amount of gas at a time, will fill in on the top, and then, because of gravity, it will fall down to the bottom. To be more accurate, it would fill the whole thing, but it'd be higher pressure at the bottom, but that pressure will still be much lower than that which had the air in it in the first place. It really depends on the air pressure at the gap, as well as uh, throughout the rest of the thing. Well, if you believe gravity holds the air pressure down to Earth, even though there is an adjacent vacuum, then you have an untested and an unproven claim because the gas will dissipate and fill the entire void. High pressure to low pressure, always. Okay, he says that it will fill the entire void, high pressure to low pressure, always. No, but if you were to do this experiment in a box like this in front of you, then it will fill the entire void. And yes, I'm a nerd. This is the closest box I had to me. But if you were to do that on like surface level of Earth in like a box you can physically pick up, then then of course it's not going to work the same way because the air pressure here is, is just so high that even a small tiny little gap at the top the, the air pressure is going to be enough to fill in the rest. To show the impossibility of the consensus scientific belief, we again need to make the vacuum infinite. We again pull down our divider just an inch and what do you think will happen? Well, of course, the high pressure gas will exit the chamber into the adjacent vacuum and be gone forever. Uh, no, no it wouldn't because Earth's gravity is, is enough to hold air to it. It's enough to hold an atmosphere. This is an untested, unverified claim that he is making, yet he seems to be the one that has a problem with that sort of thing. He, he made this in, what, Microsoft Paint? 
this is supposed to prove something. He's just asserting. That's all he's doing. All he's doing is asserting that Earth's gravity just wouldn't hold an atmosphere. When obviously that's not true. If, if this isn't the case, if gravity isn't what's holding our atmosphere together, then why is it that the air at sea level is much more dense than the air above it? What causes this gradient of pressure? Find someone with a vacuum chamber who can do this test at ground level where gravity is said to be the strongest, and you'll see if gravity will hold the gas to the earth or if the gas will adhere to the second law and exit the vacuum. See, that's exactly the problem. You're want, you want to do this experiment where gravity is your strongest, when in reality, it's where gravity is the weakest that it would have a pressure low enough to not exit out of the gap. But what do I know? Now let me show a diagram that shows what we are taught. There's the Earth, and on it we have gas pressure. But there's no container. It is simply pressing down. But above that is the endless, expanding, empty, extremely low pressure of outer space without any divider and without a container. It's not pressing down, the Earth is pulling down. Well, that's simply insane and impossible. Uh, no, it's not insane, and it's not impossible. The thing is, gravity is a force, and it's very real, and it also works on gas. So the force of gravity pulling it down, for the most part, is greater than the force of pressure pushing it upward. I don't know why that's so hard to get. So consensus science says we live on a sphere, a globe with this tiny sliver of gas pressure, or atmosphere, or air, surrounding us. Yet this all exists next to an endless vacuum? But there is no container. No walls, no ceilings to press upon. Why does a container hold the gas in? The answer, if you haven't figured it out yet, is something called the normal force. The walls of the container will push against the air, keeping it not outside the container. You don't need a container. You need a force to keep the gas wherever it's going to be. Gravity is a force just like any other, e except when you want to get more complicated with things, but it acts like a force for our purposes. He hasn't given me any evidence, any proof, or even any argument. He just, basically his argument, from what I've heard anyway, boils down to, nuh-uh. If it doesn't happen in a box that's smaller than I am, then it doesn't happen at all. This doesn't even take into account that the Earth is said to be spinning at a thousand miles per hour at the equator. Ever been on the Gravitron? As it spins, things are flung outwards. The atmosphere, the air, the gas pressure would be flung outwards, and of course, we would never even get to that point because there is no divider. Except, except if there is a centripetal force, if there is a force that was pulling us towards the Earth, that kept us not flying away from it. Okay, let's move on to another video, which is not exactly the same thing, but it's related. Let's take a look. The fact that the LAM did not have an airlock means that any container within the craft had to be designed to withstand the vacuum of space, which we are told, again, was 10 to the negative 11 tor. This is a complete error in simulation, NASA. The food pouches would explode as the aircraft depressurized, as well as the urine bags and feces and the jettison bag. Any other containers within the craft for air or for water would be subjected to the vacuum of space and would suffer the same consequences, and probably pretty dramatically. Okay, so here we have the argument that containers would burst when exposed to the near vacuum of space, or near vacuum of the surface of the moon. This again completely misunderstands what a vacuum is. A vacuum does not suck. Instead, air and liquid flows outward. So the near vacuum of space actually wouldn't have any force on the container at all. Well, hardly. It's, it's a near vacuum. But it would not be pulling it. It would not. Instead, the only thing affecting this container would be the pressure of the air or liquid or whatever inside of it. But space 
would not have its own force pulling your body apart. Here is a typical NASA fanboy or fangirl explanation, however, of why the ultra-high vacuum of space isn't a big deal. That when you walk out into space in your spacesuit, it will want to expand. But how strong is that pressure? Eh, it's only one atmosphere, so not that strong. They're specifically designed to keep the suit from ballooning out. And that, folks, is where the deception lies. It's kind of funny. He messed up like the line spacing. I don't know why he couldn't take like 20 seconds to fix that, but here we are. I think it's kind of funny. But um, basically, it says exactly what I said, but not nearly as eloquently, that the vacuum of space doesn't add any pressure to try to force it out. And that's what these guys don't get. There, there is no added pressure. All that, all that's there is the pressure that was on the inside, and that's the pressure that was already on the inside anyway. Let's hear him out. This is the type of statement that NASA gives when describing the vacuum of space. NASA tells us that the air pressure on the surface of the moon is 10 to the negative 11 torr, however, and this equates to nearly negative 2 billion psi. Do the conversion yourself, people. 10 to the negative 11 torr equates to negative pressure of 131 million atmospheres. All right, I'm going to be honest. We started at like halfway, past halfway through this video. So I'm sure he explains what he's talking about in the first half, but I cannot be bothered to sit through much more of this. But um, what he just said makes absolutely no sense. Uh, it would it would not be a negative psi. What? And when he says that that amount of tors equates to that many atmospheres, if we just type in just even into Google, where's the carrot key? Ten to the power of negative eleven tor to psi. One point nine three or so times ten to the negative thirteen pounds per square inch, or as I prefer to say it. 1.93 e negative 13 psi and that's not a negative pressure that's just a really really low pressure that's pretty close to zeros that negative 13 isn't making the whole number negative that's moving all of those numbers to the right side of the decimal well right side that's that's right for you guys to the right side of the decimal to further illustrate this point I corresponded with a company who specializes in vacuum lifting after seeing one of their promo videos. The representative who emailed me back stated that they can achieve 25 tons of lift by creating roughly an 80% vacuum, 165 tor, between their lifting pads and the massive pipe here as an example. That is near the level of vacuum achieved that collapses train tanker cars. That negative pressure uses the fact that the air outside of the pipe, especially underneath it, is pushing or pulling so hard in an attempt to get into the little space between the lifter and the pipe that it can achieve 25 tons of lift. Are you starting to understand the amount of force that the inside of the spacesuits and spacecrafts that NASA built would have to withstand to maintain integrity? Okay, let's t uh, let's take this bit by bit. He he was talking about the force that these um vacuum lift things use, and I don't really understand why. Because it's not the vacuum that's lifting it; it's the vacuum that's making a connection to the thing you're picking up. But he also brought up collapsing train uh, tanker cars. Which I believe, yeah, he was talking about that and he showed some examples uh, early in the video. I, I didn't watch it. <laughs> that has nothing to do with this, though. Because you can suck air out of train tanker cars until the pressure in it is so low that it gets crushed and collapsed. But that's not because of the pressure on the inside pulling the, the, uh, the container in. That's the pressure on the outside pushing the container in. It's not the low pressure that causes force, it's the high pressure that causes force. If there's a vacuum, a perfect vacuum, on the inside of a train tanker car, that perfect vacuum does absolutely nothing. It applies 
absolutely no force, it has no pressure, it has no negative pressure because that doesn't exist, then if you have the pressure of the atmosphere around it, that is pushing on the inside because that is pressure, and pressure puts pressure on containers. All right, I think that's going to be it for this video, but if all things go to plan, then you're getting twice as many videos as you did last week, so be grateful. <laughs> so thank you for watching, unless you didn't want to watch, in which case, I apologize. You sat through like the whole thing. This is the end now. What are you doing? What are you doing with your life? What am I doing with my life? I just realized I'm doing that exact same thing, watching videos that I don't like. I also want to say that um, this is a real game that really exists. It is the Bible game for the PlayStation 2. If you want to see me play this on stream, then uh, check out my Twitch. I'm going to be doing that this Sunday. Definitely check that out. You can chat with me while I'm doing it. Hoping, hoping my schedule and the stars will align themselves to allow me to actually make good on my promises for once. So, uh, see you then, and goodbye.